Okay. I, think it's good. I don't know if I can edit some of this out or not. Anyway. <laughs> Well, I am thankful to be here at Gordon, Garden City Primitive Baptist Church this morning. It's, a, it's always a thrill to come down here, whether I am uh, supplying or just come down here to uh, enjoy God's Word being preached here. Uh, I've developed a love for this church many years ago. Uh, I was had one of the scariest points in my uh, preaching career here. I was supplying one night, and in comes Lindy Jr. Known him all his li- all our lives, so I wasn't worried about him too much. A few moments later, here comes Brother Ronnie. I said, "Uh oh!" And then, lo and behold, who else could come in? Brother Lindy Senior. I went to shaking in my boots because I loved him and I cared about him. And, and he, uh, but I, he told me after the service, don't you ever worry about a preacher sitting in your congregation because that man or these men, as he referred to his family there, will be praying for you harder than anybody else because they have been where you are. So I was very thankful for that, and I'm always thankful to be able to come and be among y'all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for just a moment. Almighty and our merciful God, which art in heaven, we bow before you at this time, coming to praise and glorify you in your holy name. For Lord, there's none like you. There's none else that we can come and honor in this way. So, Father, we come with thanksgiving in in our hearts for the love that you have shown us by the gift that you gave of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior who came down to earth and died on the cross bearing our sins and who rose up out of the grave again. Father, accept our worship this day. Accept our worship every time we bow before you in prayer. Father, as we've gathered here, we've mentioned many names. And Lord, I do hold them up to you as well as those at, at the, wherever thy people are, are meet together. We just hold all those who have a need, whether it be of body, mind, or spirit. But this morning, Lord, I feel a little burdened to especially mention Brother Ronnie. Um. I've just told this congregation that he is very dear to me. But so, Father, I hold him up, and especially him and his family, as they are even now seeking healing from this leukemia. So hold them close, Lord. Comfort them. Comfort their hearts. Now, Father, I would ask that you be with our nation in its struggles. Lord, cause us to turn again. Turn again to Thee, O Lord. Cause us to repent of our sins. Father, we do pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we do ask for Thy blessings. Lord, bless us that we might glorify Thy name. And Father, I pray that You would continue to bless this Garden City Primitive Baptist Church as she continues to serve You here in this place. And it's in Christ's precious and holy name I ask it. And amen. Sister Jean, I told you a while ago that I had some problems this this week as I prepared. Um, The message that I'm going to share with you this morning, I prepared several weeks ago. And to be honest, I did everything I could after reading it over and editing it to put it to the side. Now, the Lord blessed me to be able to share uh, other messages since I tried to put that message to this message to the side. 
But this week, I had in my mind, realize, think about what I just said, I had in my mind the idea that I would preach to you about Jesus in Mark chapter 2, chiding the Pharisees and John's disciples about their ritualistic uh, fasting and, and his explanation and uh, as he went forward there. But I, I'll tell you, uh, I just continued to come back to this message that I've prepared this morning. So, it's not what I choose. It's what the Lord has led me to do. So, I pray that the Lord will bless us together this morning. That he'll bless the thoughts and the words which he has given us to use today. My message this morning, I have titled it, if you will, Christian Citizenship in the United States of America. Now, earlier this year, on July the 4th, we celebrated our 244th uh, years of independence. Now, on that day, those, all those years ago, the first of 56 men signed their names to the bottom of a document called the Declaration of Independence. This Declaration of Independence declared the independence of the newly formed United States of America from the tr Trinity tr tyranny, excuse me, of Great Britain. And it gave a list of grievances as to the reasons why they declared their we declared our independence. But there's something important that we have to note there. While we were declaring our, while they were declaring their independence from Great Britain, they also declared their dependence and our dependence in the Almighty God. Now, if you go to reading this Declaration of Independence, you'll find in it at least four times where they appeal to God by name as they express their dependence or their reliance on, on God, their creator. Now, if you want to look for it, I'll give you a hint to where to find it. Twice in the first two sentences, they make an appeal to God. And then in the last paragraph, we also find where they make an appeal to the supreme God of the world. And they stated that they had firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Now, to me, that is saying the Lord God Almighty. But these men, these men, we call them our founding fathers, did not hold that God should be separate from government. But they declared in this statement that Government depends on the Almighty. Now my text this morning comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 17 through 21. Matthew 22, verses 17 through 21. Jesus is in a conversation with with the Pharisees or the Sadducees or a lawyer or some, someone, I, I, I didn't record enough of my text to, uh, to, to remember it. But then in verse 17, they're questioning the Lord, and this is what they say. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? So we know they're trying to trap him. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is the image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. 
Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Now in this teaching, Jesus establishes for his followers and for all citizens the supportive, active relationship that we are to have with our governments. Today we in the United States live in a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. And we are to have an active role in our government, which, if I understand it correctly, is a constitutional republic wherein the chief executive and representatives are elected by its citizens and that the laws for that election are set up in a written constitution as well as are the laws or the rules for those elected uh, chief executive and representatives that we send to Washington. Now thought may be occurring to you and it may not. But you may be asking, he says I'm supposed to have an active role. What kind of active role am I go, do I need to have? Well, we'll come to that. But today my message concerns our active roles in government. However minor we think our active role might be. So I've got five points concerning our active roles. First is Christians as citizens of the kingdom of God and as citizens of the United States of America. First, beloved, we are to pray for our government, for our duly elective, elected chief executive and for our representatives. We're to pray that they should would seek after the Lord, that they would seek after him, seeking his wisdom, and the fact that they're trying to lead this great nation. We look at old Israel. and We see those mighty kings. We see Solomon, David, and Saul. We see them seeking after the Lord that they might rule over this nation of Israel. Yes, they made their mistakes, but they sought after the Lord. Paul, he writes to uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 2 in chapter 2, and he instructs Timothy, as he's residing there in Ephesus, that they should be praying for their leaders. And, and I want to share that passage with you, uh, verses 1 through 3 in 1 Timothy 2. Paul writes there, I exhort therefore, first, of all supplications, prayers, and intercession, and thanksgiving, and giving of thanks, be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. You'll notice that the first instruction in that that he gives Timothy is that prayer be made first for all men. Then he adds that we should be especially in prayer for our leaders. Today we would call them our presidents, our senators, and our representatives. And then it breaks on down to all of our local leaders that we have elected to rule over us on, on different levels of government. And again, to what end? Paul says, that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. We're to next to support our government. Jesus tells us in our text that we're to pay our taxes. He didn't suggest it. He says, render unto Caesar the, unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. So he gave us a command. He was straightforward with what he said. He didn't beat around the bush with it. He says, pay your taxes to Caesar and pay your tithes and offerings unto God. <clears throat> and he even set us, set us 
an example. Matthew 17 and 24 records this. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He said, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter said unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast, it, cast in hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take that and give unto them for me and thee. And Paul reiterates the importance that, of the tribute that we're supposed to be paying. He says in Romans 13 and 7, Render therefore unto all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to, un, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So it, as, I, as I read this, that verse 7 there, it tells me that we are supposed to support, respect, and honor our national government. We are to take delight in that government and the privileges that we have as citizens in this blessed nation, no matter that there are those who desire to tear it down. And Scripture even covers that. Peter in 2 Peter 2 and 10 describes those who would tear down the nation. He says, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lustness of un lust of uncleanliness and despise government. Presumptuous they are. Excuse me. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed. They are not afraid to speak e evil of dignitaries. So we are warned even back then of those who would cause disruption in, in, in our governments. But as I move to my next point, we are, we are called to be submissive to our government. Jesus, Peter, and Paul all gave us instructions pertaining to this. Jesus in our text, where he says, pay your taxes. And then Paul in Romans 13 and 1, he, had, he had, uh, wrote to those in Rome, and then Peter in second, or 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and 14, well, he says this, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Now, sadly, we have to realize then and even today that there are those who do not submit to the lawful government as God would have us to do as we're seeking. And, and we're seeing this today. We even see it among some of our elected officials. But brothers and sisters, as Christians, we are to generally be submissive to those governmental authorities submitting to the rule of law, even if others don't. Government exists to keep order. And I'm going to repeat myself. Uh, they keep order to the end that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. And, I, and I'll add this. While we may not respect the man or the woman holding a particular office in our government, we should at least respect the office that they hold. As I come to my fourth point, I might seem like I'm going off in another direction, but so I, I'm going to ask you, please don't try to re read between the lines here. We are to stand up to our government. Now, I don't mean an open rebellion, but there's a lawful way to do it. We, according to the First Amendment, can petition the government for a redress of grievances. That's how we resist unjust and unrighteous authority. But then again, there are times, according again to, to Peter, 
And they told, told those, uh, answered those questions as they stood before the Sanhedrin. He says, we ought to obey God rather than men. So if you want to read a little bit more up on resisting uh, government in a rightful way, I'll point you to 1 Kings 18, Daniel chapter 6, and Acts verses chapters 3 and 4. But beloved, we, we must sometimes use our freedom to defend, to defend our freedom or we might lose our freedom. In November of this year, we're going to select our governmental leaders. We'll be selecting our president, a lot of senators, and a lot of representatives. Now, a few minutes ago, I said that we should take an active role in our government. And that role is the selecting of our governmental officials, our chief executive and our representatives. And the most basic participation that most of us can have is voting. So by voting, we determine those who will lead our nation, those who will make our laws and protect our freedoms. In Exodus 18 and 21, God describes those that we are to choose. And he says we're to choose able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Those are the type of men that we're to, to be electing. And what about electing? What about voting? Well, we can't legally vote unless we're registered to vote. I looked up some statistics there. They're at least 10 years old. They may be older than that. But they show only that there are only about 65% of those who are, who are of voting age who are registered to vote. And then the statistics went on to show that only about 50% of those who are registered actually voted in any given election. So my friends, my brothers and sisters, if you are not registered to vote, go and register to vote. If you have friends who are not registered to vote, take them with you and get them registered as well. And don't put it off. You know, there's a cutoff time. You have to be reg registered before such and such a date in order to be able to vote in November. So please don't put it off. Now, next step sounds like it's time for me to tell you how to vote, but I'm not going to tell you how to vote. But rather, I'm going to share with you how I'm going to choose whom I am going to be voting for. Am I going to name any names? No. I'm going to call on you, though. I'm going to call on you to vote, and I pray that you will vote your Christian values. Because it's been said that Bad politicians are elected by good people, good people who do not vote. So I encourage you to be an informed voter. I encourage you to be a praying voter and vote for the people and the issues which best match your values. Don't just go and mark that mark a name as you go into that uh, ballot. Now, I said Christian values. I've, I'll share with you four values that I have when I consider voting for a person. And again, this is me. The first value that I try to look at in a person to consider whether he is worthy of my vote or whether I should vote for him or not is that is he a Christian? Is he someone who has produced fruits in seeking after God is he seeking after righteousness? Matthew 6 and 33 says, but seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If someone is that, oh, seeking it that way, that man is worth consideration. My second value is life. The first inalienable right that's listed in the Declaration of Independence is life. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life is valuable. 
Life comes from the Creator. It is precious. It's miraculous. And it's delicate. And according to the Declaration of Independence, life is a fundamental right. It's a right given by God. Psalms 139, 13 through 16. The psalmist there is amazed at his own life, at his own existence, that he actually is a living and breathing being. And this is what he says as he addresses God. He says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members are written, which in continuous continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. The lives of God's children are precious to him. So I take this also into consideration, the candidate's stand on the protection protection of human life, from abortion to embryonic experimentation to euthanasia. and, and, And in other words, I consider his stand on life from the womb to the tomb. My next value that I want to discuss with you is family. To me, family is basic. It's fundamental. It is, or rather it was, and really it still is, the first institution created by God. Genesis 2 and 24, God has brought the woman to Adam. And it says there, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now I understand that there have been many, many studies that show that children need the influence of both a father and a mother. We look at what God has created and put together there in Genesis. So God began the family with a male and a female as partners in his pattern for marriage and for a family. And if this has not changed despite those who have tried to redefine God's institution of marriage and family. So I'm going to vote for the candidate who I understand stands for the biblical definition of marriage and family. Now the First Amendment and I'll read a portion of it to you in just a moment, protects our freedom of expression and religion, our freedom to worship. And this is the last of the values that I mentioned this morning. Reading there from that First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people, peaceful to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. I don't believe that there are any of you who doubt that today our religious freedoms are being attacked. There are some, there are some who would undermine the Judeo-Christian principles of the Bible They're trying to undermine the intents of our founding fathers in this, the First Amendment, and the other amendments that are under fire with the intent to take these costly and precious and priceless freedoms away from us. Beloved, I will not vote for anyone who advocates the removal of our freedom to worship or remove the public expression of religion from the public arena. I will be voting for the candidate who stands by the First Amendment as the founders wrote it and as it gives us our religious freedoms. I'll be voting for the man who will stand up with us as we stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherein Christ hath made us free and not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. 
after the approval of the Declaration of Independence, there was a call to have it read publicly, after which the cannons would be fired and a bell was rang in celebration. We call that bell today, as it rang there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We call it now the Liberty Bell. It was given this name because of the proclamation of liberty that it preceded when they rang that bell to draw the people there. And it rang after the reading because it proclaimed liberty throughout the land and unto all the inhabitants thereof. Leviticus 25 and 10. Now those points again, I'll share them with you again very briefly. We're to seek God for our government by praying for his divine leadership. We're to support our government by paying your taxes and taking pride in your government. We're to submit to our government according to the rule of law. We're to stand up to our government using our freedoms to defend our freedoms. And we're to select our government by exercising our right to vote. And I pray that you will vote in Christian values. In addition, I also share with you my values in, uh, that I will be using as I seek to whom I will vote for. And again, those are a Christian, a man who stands for life, liberty, life for family and freedom. And I've shared this with y'all. I've shared these points with y'all. And, and ask that y'all consider that as, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and as citizens of the United States of America, y'all consider these points. I, I, I pr hope it's right to pray, but I pray that your values and my values would be the same, same as those that I'd listed. That together we might join in proclaiming liberty throughout the land. Liberty to live in peace. Liberty to worship the Lord our God. Seeking the freedom that are given us by God and that were given us by our founding fathers. Again, my prayer is that God will bless America and that the freedom that we have may be enjoyed throughout the land and to all to God's glory and praise.